afternoon, everybody. Welcome to We Demand Games. The uh, GDC uh, people have asked me to remind you to please silence your cell phones for takeoff, and also um, to remind you to please to rate the talk afterwards. Uh, I'm Owen Gottlieb, Assistant Professor of uh, Interactive Games and Media at Rochester Institute of Technology, and I'm also there at the Magic Center. So I teach in the School of Interactive Games and Media, and the Magic Center is our uh, game studio and also a laboratory where we do all kinds of research. There I'm the founder and the principal researcher at the Initiative in Religion, Culture, and Policy at the Magic Center. This is our new campus, uh, our new building which is opening in the fall, a brand new building where we're moving from a beautiful building to a very special new building so maybe you'll have a chance to come and visit. At the Initiative, uh, which I, we call RCP, we do original design and research on literacy and comparative religion, exploring what anthropologists call the acquisition of cultural practices, basically how people hand down aspects of their cultural practices and create new practices within a, a cultural group. And all this is targeted to policy impact, either in education or in governmental policy. And uh, we're faculty at RIT, we're faculty at about seven other institutions and that's growing, and many fantastic graduate students and undergraduate students. We have an uh, alum here, Ruben, today, who is a part of uh, what we have created, and Ian Schreiber as well. We've recently released two tabletop games in the Lost and Found series, and we also have a digital prototype that we delivered for the mobile phone uh, for our strategy game for the National Endowment for the Humanities. So our games are released on, uh, via Game Crafter, which is one of the places that I'm going to speak about today and do some targeted case studies about our work there. They're for sale to the public using print-on-demand. And these games happen to be about teaching religious legal systems. So the games are set in Fustat, Old Cairo in the 12th century, and the first two games address a Jewish legal code by Moses Maimonides called the Mishnah Torah, and we're currently in development on an Islamic law expansion module. We hear a lot these days about negative per, uh, perceptions and fears around religious legal systems, but we hear very little about what evolutionary anthropologists call the pro-social aspects of religion. And these law systems were primary form of governance, promoting community sustainability, collaboration and cooperation. You can see this in the game play. And we're working to expand that discourse around religious legal systems in their historical and geographic context, uh, contexts. So print-on-demand comes into play in many different aspects of my work and the work of, of the team members, both in the design studio and also in research in the field as we take our games out to be played and watch what happens when people play them and different iterations of them. And then also teaching game design in the classroom. So when I'm teaching game design and development, using these systems to help students learn about what it means to ship and that whole process. And it's really centered around getting something on sale and in the hands of players. So I teach my students um, about backwards planning, planning and visioning and the importance of having a picture in mind of your goal and have your team bought into that goal as a North Star with uh, which to navigate and to inspire and aspire. And so this was kind of the vision that had started it off. These are the finished games in shrink wrap uh, that we have had received back. And uh, the idea was could we get a box game in our and have it, and so this was our North Star. We actually had one game in mind, and we ended up with two games, which I'm very excited about. So I start here with this realized vision of games in my hands, and then we'll work backwards. So this is me turning around the box. I can't believe after the years of work we put into it, I'm holding the game, it's gonna go on the shelf. This is the strategy game, and here's uh, the party game. So how did I formulate the vision that we would eventually together realize? Well, I had my previous game, Jewish Time Jump New York, is a mobile GPS augmented reality game for teaching history on location in Washington Square Park in New York City. And the game was built on Eris, an open source platform, and so the game is free for players. I'm very proud of the game, and I learned a great deal about getting games into the hands of players and on the market with that project. Now, Jewish Time Jump, while it was a critical success and it's a success from our players' perspective, keeping it up to date required tremendous and consistent effort every time the software updated. So every time the Eris platform updated or every time iOS was updated and we had to rescale everything for the screen size. And entering this new game series, I wanted a game that wouldn't require constant updating and nor would it require the kind of raising of funds that I need to do to support that kind of updating. 
meanwhile, at the same time, my research is shifting. So I've been shifting focus from place-based games for teaching history into looking and, at and analyzing the parallels between medieval legal codes and game systems. Both are rule-based systems, and I had moved kind of the law project to the forefront. So we were looking at genres of tabletop games that would fit with law codes regarding, in particular, lost and found objects. We were thinking about things like resource management. And I'm committed to the intersection of the embodied and the digital, just like you see with the GPS game out in Washington Square Park. And so we turned to a card to mobile approach with games like Think About Agricola or Settlers of Catan that you have a tabletop game and they also have a mobile version of it. So I was determined to have a game that we'd have a version that could sit on the shelf for decades without the need for digital update or for emulators to run it, because I always get sad when I have to go, oh, I have to somehow find an emulator for this game, and leaving behind also the freeware model of Jewish Time Jump, because I was going to prove that I could generate revenue, even if small, that could turn back into support the research and the kind of work that we're doing about games and learning. So I spent a great deal of time researching what it would mean to publish an analog game, talking to friends and colleagues who had published tabletop games and gone through all the trials and tribulations of that process. And eventually, I landed on print-on-demand as the only viable option given my needs and constraints. So we settled on the Game Crafter, and I'll speak briefly about some other options. Uh, over the course of about three years, I worked closely with students, including uh, Matthew Fastman, Ryan Muskoff, a number of other students, uh, exploring all the affordances and limits of print-on-demand. And then we learned about those firsthand in the hard way. And I hope that the takeaways today, when you uh, make your decisions going into print-on-demand, uh, you'll take those with you, and uh, we'll have gone ahead and, and forged the bridge for you a bit. So this is the, the, the Game Crafter storefront. You also may be familiar with uh, print and play from Ad Magic, the people who make Cards Against Humanity. Um, and uh, this, is, this site has advanced since we were making our decisions. Um, it wasn't the right fit for us then. It, it could be now. We kind of scouted this whether to determine it was a good fit. You know, they now have a storefront as well. And I have students in my class now in game design and development who are also using Shapeways to uh, sell straight to market game pieces that are 3D printed. Another kind of model to keep in mind. So we landed on print-on-demand, and uh, this is the, the Shapeways site. We landed on uh, print-on-demands, and so I want to discuss what could print-on-demand afford us. So here's like a, a quite, kind of quick sense of what it was going to mean for us, that we could release a game that didn't require expensive and regular updates, that we could move forward to commercialization, right? Our games are on the market in the hands of paying customers now with an extremely low budget. We could pilot a game that way and get it to market without having to already have high sales figures. We could print prototypes with our art and put them in the hands of players in volume quantities and lower cost than actually having to print each, edition, each one at our uh, university print shop, for example. And we could develop a game for research with a shelf-worthy look and feel, that kind of sense of what I was holding in my hands. And maybe even more importantly from a pro perspective, I could avoid these things I really wanted to avoid. So I wanted to avoid laying out thousands of dollars to make a print run prior to sales, uh, so low budget entry to market. I didn't have to run a Kickstarter campaign uh, and raise funds and do community management for Kickstarter and or do supply chain logistics for making sure that uh, things get shipped out to all the people who contribute. I was very hesitant to go the Kickstarter route, especially on this project. But in general, I see the, the tremendous effort that people who do Kickstarters have to do. I wanted to try to spend more time in the design studio if possible. And when I talk about supply chain logistics, some of the things I'm talking about are, for example, warehousing. If you're going to order 1,000 games, you've got to usually pay rent and store them somewhere, especially if you're in a city and you don't happen to have a safe space to store cardboard. Um, other aspects of the supply chain logistics have to do with the distribution. Am I going to have to walk to the post office you know, four or five times a week with bundles in my hand in order to get there and ship them out? And then I had spent some time uh, doing some work in supply chain logistics when I was a, um, a management consultant and, and knew about aspects of the system like RMAs, so return merchandise authorizations, and I did not want to get involved with that. I want to concentrate on game design um, development and looking at how people learn with games. In addition, the storefront would give us merchandising so I wouldn't have to fight for shelf space anywhere. So that was important. And then thinking about working with a printer, one of my friends had said to me, listen, um, when you're working on getting your analog game printed, you need to go to China and you need to meet in person with your printer because you need to have a relationship with that printer or things are going to go sideways. 
and I really didn't want to have to build a relationship and go to China, and I had really no way of going to China. It's someday I want to go to China, but not for working, you know, with, with working on the printer in that regard. So these are all things that I could avoid. Now on the con side, because I want you to know about some of the issues, right, that are right up front that we're dealing with, you have an increase in printing cost uh, when you don't go bulk. So if you haven't gone bulk, you're going to be paying a great deal for uh, printing costs on an individual game, or even maybe 10 or 15 or 20, the price is going to go up. We're going to talk a greater length when I do the case studies about not having product safety testing and ways that there are workarounds for dealing with that. Um, we still needed product liability insurance, and I'm going to tie that back to the issue of safety testing. Um, we weren't directly working with a printer, so I couldn't pick up the phone and talk to the printer and say, listen, this is an issue. Right? So that's a downside of not having a relationship with a printer. So we have higher prices and then lower margins. We're talking about very, very low margins because of the cost of printing in a um, print-on-demand service that you're not doing bulk with. So I want to take you inside some of the what, case studies of working uh, inside of the Game Crafter in particular so that you can um, avoid some of these pitfalls that we've had. And we're gonna start at the very end of production, and I like to call this one the case of the greedy grabber. For those of you who haven't been inside on, on the Game Crafter, this is the inside. You can see these patterned card backs, and I'll show you in more detail. All of the art in the game is based on uh, architecture of Fustat Cairo in the 12th century, and so this is where you kind of put up all of your individual cards. This is, uh, we, I have the students in my class have to have everything ready on Game Crafter. They're not forced to actually take it to market, but they have to understand the production process to get it so they could take it to market. This is another card back uh, working on architectural patterns. And we're gonna talk about play mats and cards. So one of the things, these are play mats from the game. So it's a, largely a card game. This is also important to think about because the cost of say a meeple is gonna be much larger than the cost of a card. And so many of the designers I've been talking to have been saying, okay, we're gonna go all card. And you can take mechanics that are based in things that would be more expensive, make them a card mechanic, and be able to ship a game that's much more affordable. So we went the card route from the beginning with the exception of our instruction booklet and these play mats. So there's play mats that each player has, and then there's a communal play mat where communal play takes place. And this is what the communal play mat looks like so that people are placing their cards. It's a game about balancing your communal responsibilities with your family responsibilities, collaboration, cooperation, competition, mixing, and then the trade-off decisions that players start having to make in doing that. And this is the cowherd roll, uh, roll card. So that's the play mat that the cowherd is, uh, plays. And, and the, we have both male and female characters for each of the, um, for each of the roles in the game. Now, this is about QA. So there's markings on here that are not the actual cards, they're QA markings. We went through about 19 QA cycles on the last version of this, and I wanted to show specifically ways that we approached QA. So I'm gonna close in on the money purse in the river. And right, this is so if we have about seven, eight people doing rounds of QA, because all the details right, have to be uh, gone over and over and over again, that this would point out to them where they needed to look on each one and mark that. So we did about 19 rounds of QA on the version that goes to the printer. We did a few early print rounds to test things out, but now we're talking about the one we took to market. We did that and then I ordered proof copies of the game so I could pull the game out, I could look at it, I could go through every aspect, check all the printing, check the, the, uh, the card ends, everything, went through the whole thing and it looked gorgeous. We were like so excited. So the teams gathered around. We're looking at this. Okay, we can go to ship. So we had shipped one of each game. We then order 10 of each. Now these are games in the $35 range and you pay shipping and you pay shipping insurance. So we get the boxes back, open it up, and we start spot checking. And this is one of the play mats. Now you'll notice on the bottom that there's cutoff. So completed communal responsibility is partially cut off. And on the cow herd, you can see that beyond the law pile at the bottom right is cut off and the T of transgression is cut off. We're going like, how is this possible? Like, we have a proof in our hand that this didn't happen, and yet this is happening. So we can't imagine what it is. And we start to do investigation, and I reach out, and you're, you're, I'm writing right to the game crafter. And we went back to the designer who followed the specs very closely, and eventually we found out that if you pull the template and you look at the margins on the template, that you have to follow the margin on the template exactly, and that the stats on the left won't work to get you there. And from there we got into, I talked to a printer friend of mine at the university, and he took me back to my old days when I was working in print and said, oh, well, you know, there's bleed and no bleed printing, by the way. And so when you are going to uh, print in bulk, it's actually going to 
change the way apparently the game crafter uh, is going to do this. So there's a page actually in Help that, talk, that they talk about in, in detail that you know, we found months later, this might not even have been up when we first looked, that talk about the registration settings and all this, but we had no idea even to look for this at all. Um, so what happens is the grabber on the, on the multi-print is gonna pick it up and it's gonna grab the sides of it and because it's doing bulk for some reason, it's actually gonna grab further in so there's no room for any kind of sway. So what we eventually do is uh, I, I hand redid all of the mats and we get to where the cowherd mat looks more like this to deal with what I call the greedy grabber. And now the, you know, now the game is out and it, this is fixed and we fixed the 10 copies we got back. But for anyone who's going to look at this, you, know, you wanna get into the details of, of how to work with things like the difference between getting a proof copy, which is not a proof copy, and how that can change in scale, and in particular into some of these uh, printing aspects. So a proof copy will not clue you in, plan for the greedy grabber. That's case study one. This is the case of don't eat this game. And so I'm not an attorney. This is not legal advice. If you want that, you need to seek out an attorney. This is a story about what I researched and then decided to do, and I hope that it's informing for you when you're working in print on demand. So this is part of the page of Lost and Found the Strategy Game, and if you go into the text a little deeper, you'll see we have a line that says, may contain inks that should not be ingested, not suitable for children younger than 14 years. Is anyone familiar with this issue of testing? Couple people. Great, so, uh, and you'll see, so 14 years is our text, and then you'll actually see a button from the Game Crafter that says 12 plus. So what are we talking? What is this all about? What well, has to do with the hazards to children and players such that anything from a small sharp piece to an untested ink in the card, imagine you have a printer overseas or even here. Well, if you don't test the inks with an independent laboratory, they could have lead in them, for example, and if an overzealous player or child decides to chew on a card, right? You're in, in trouble, you get the picture. So we started to look at, we, we dug into this, working with Ryan Muskoff and working with, uh, with Matthew Fassman, started to dig into the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, regarding third party testing. And they're saying, well, you don't have to test if it's children 12 and under, but actually we further researched to look at our responsibility and liability potential, and we talked to other game designers. And our target audience is high school and up, including undergraduates. We wanted games that were sophisticated enough to have undergraduates engaged in play, but for it to be accessible to high school students. The regulations are actually complex and ambiguous, and in some ways we decided to err on the side of caution by including an age restriction in the marketing and merchandising of the game. So we're not gonna read all that, but we you know, went through this with a fine tooth comb. And the Game Crafter actually says they don't do lab testing. If you go do pricing for lab testing, it's maybe in the three, $5,000 range, maybe in the 1,000, depending on the lab or the kinds of tests that you're gonna uh, wanna run or consider. And the Game Crafter says, we don't do it, you know, we don't make games for kids, and then their definition is 12, uh, 12 and under. And I, you know, so I spent a lot of time talking to labs. Now the actual standard actually makes reference to 14 years of age in addition to mandatory testing for 12 year olds, um, and so, so we picked 14 as the age cutoff. 14's, for us, the most relevant standard for our product. Um, and GameCrafter only offers badges for 12 plus because of their reading of the regulation, and 18 plus for mature games, I guess. And, uh, but our box text and our actual boxes, they're marked for 14 and over. So what I decided for myself, we also got product liability insurance, and we, you know, we work with um, Magic Spell Studios to do that. And I had one designer say, you must get product liability insurance. So we went ahead and, and got that. And I would say know the limits of the print on demand upfront and plan for them and check the relevant regulations and confer with other people who've done it before and just plan accordingly for this. Um, and there are hundreds and hundreds of games available on print on demand. And I think many of them don't take this into account, but because we dug into it for so long, I wanted to share that with you and kind of the thoughts about how to take this I think, you know, more safely to market. This is called the curious case of the sand timer that grew. We, uh, in, the, in, the, in the party game, we have this, you can either, you can dial down or dial up the time for how long people are gonna have to tell their story with. And so we said, man, it would be great if we could put, you know, a timer in the box. So we said, all right, well, the timer, they have all these amazing pieces that you can put into your games, and it's about $2.30. So we said, all right, let's, let's do that. And then, 
the cascading decisions start to come, as we know with coding, right, also the case with print on demand. So we had a medium sized box, and then yet we actually have to, yeah, gotta count the cards and figure out how many cards can fit in the box, and could we fit the timer in the box? And so we're sitting there, you know, stacking cards and counting cards and figuring out the dimensions and doing all this. And we eventually figure out that if we get the timer, we're gonna actually have to go up in box size. And if we go up in box size, you're gonna have to buy the bottom box and the top box and a wrap for the images on it. And the process kind of expands with that timer. And so the timer increase to produce the game went from 230 for the timer, an additional $3 in increase in box cost, and then we were gonna have to redesign all of our box layouts. And uh, so, you know, we decided people could use their watch because for a game in the 30 to $35 range, I'm not adding $6 to the purchase price for a timer. Um, so that's the case of the timer that grew. So the cascading decisions that happen when you're trying to make small changes because they're gonna have all these physical effects as well. So using print on demand in the design studio uh, and in research for the field allows us to do things that we wouldn't normally be able to do and testing games with people with artwork and being able to print some of the, the pros that we went over earlier. Now in the game design classroom, I use it for things like, okay, you're a producer, what are your milestones? What are your deliverables? And how are you gonna backwards plan to get there? So you've gotta budget your pieces and you have to know are you gonna put a timer in that box or not? And, we, uh, and my, my colleague Ian Schreiber, you know, they usually get a price that they need to hit and it's a pretty low price and then they can usually barter, uh, they can usually pitch to us as producers to say do they get a couple more bucks on their budget. Um, so they're budgeting as well. So I find it particularly helpful when thinking about what does it mean to get something into the hands of a player and that process of backwards planning and producing. So there are benefits to doing it that way. So some takeaways, and I also want to open it up to questions. Plan ahead, learn the details of the print-on-demand system. Weigh that decision of, your, are you going to go digital, analog, print-on-demand, mix, right? Keep an eye on the differences in single proofing versus volume, with the case of the greedy grabber regarding printer differences. Uh, realize that small shifts and changes will have ripples uh, in terms of formatting and cost, and please um, don't eat the game. That would be my probably number one request. Uh, thank you very much, that's the formal piece, and so I'd love to entertain questions about print on demand because I could talk about this for a very long time, but I want to make an opportunity to converse with you. If you can come to the center and speak to the mic, that's the best way to get your question, and then I'll repeat the question. Uh, so yeah, uh, Kevin O'Gorman, I teach at the Art Institute of Dallas and uh, Richland College also in Dallas. And just to back your play here, I've been doing this for a year. Um, and just to commiserate with uh, the game crafter, another cautionary tale. Uh, I had worked on a tabletop game for two years design wise and getting, buying myself uh, the prototypes as we iterated along and had it down to the final stretch, and it was a tile-based game, so I was using the literally, you know, like drink coaster, thick tiles and stuff. Right when Game Crafter switched from the die cut method to the laser cut for their, the giant slugs for those. And so up till then, they would die cut and bag the tiles. And right when I was ready to design the box and go for it, they switched to the laser cut, which meant they left them unpunched in the slugs. And so my game no longer fit in the small box because I had sheets. And so I actually did call them and, and begged and pleaded. What's their phone number? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shot them an email and then uh, ran into them at a, a board game conference and stuff. So I, I, I you know, harassed them. And they said there's really nothing that they could do about it. And uh, so I actually had to switch from the like, coaster style tiles to card thickness, square cards. Um, to replace the tiles, just to, to maintain my, yeah. my footprint in the box. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that does happen. So I was gonna say, you know, there's, there's a, the, the great benefit, I, you know, I couldn't do this without Game Crafter, and so I have tremendous, you know, love for their, their product and their service and what they do. And because of what they're doing, right, we have to deal with some of these things. And it's probably through our community where we're sharing these things and trying to plan ahead and trying to test things that we'll get there. So mm -hmm. um, I think using a service like this has uh, benefits and drawbacks, but I'm much happier with the benefits than I am 
uh, you know, upset about the drawbacks, oh, but yeah. they're tough. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the whole idea of, I, I do the same thing, my students, uh, their, their classwork has to be uh, GameCrafter ready, <laughs> like you were saying, but I don't require them. But right. I, I've had two students, you know, publish their stuff on, on the GameCrafter, so it, it does work. I'm getting a, sorry, I'm getting a minute warning. Yeah. I'm trying to see it in the back. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm gonna be around afterwards in the, in the um, after area and I'm happy to talk to people out there. Yes, hi. Hi, I just got one question. Uh, like I'm, I'm working myself for a board game publisher in Poland and run kind of game jams and, uh, and this kind of courses with the, with the universities. Is there a big problem for you to reach out for professional uh, publisher help the, all the all this all these problems it's my first lesson that I that I teach on a, on a, on my course for uh, uh, for board game development process uh, so this could I could also help you in some kind is there a very big uh, big uh, big distance between uh, publishing business and education yes. uh, in, I, I mean, in, in Europe yeah like in Europe, we don't have this. What's, what's this difficulty in the U.S.? Well, we probably have millions of people trying to go to. In, my guess is millions of people trying to go to individual publishers. So kind of like trying to break into Hollywood studios. And so I think my perception is until you have very high sales, like for example, the Captain is Dead has thousands and thousands of sales, and they were then they pitched to I think Eon Games. But I think the difference between making a game and showing that it's viable in the market is probably part of what is the distance between a publisher that'll say, we'll take your game, versus the hundreds and hundreds of other people who are trying to pitch their games. That's my guess. So, um, you know, okay, if there you, are... You're guessing, yeah? Because, for example, the game that was launched on my game jam uh, two years ago, now hit the market. And meanwhile, we had a games that, uh, for example, Nemesis campaign uh, reached 4 million bucks on uh, uh, on Kickstarter. Yeah, so we can... As, those as, are proven financially. They've made yeah, $4 million. Yes, yeah. but also we had we have space after after launching that successful campaigns to collaborate with universities just to teach our future uh, future employees that we can uh, that we can start out while cooperating with uh, with educational business. That, that we, it would be great th to potentially th th collaborate. This is mutually beneficial. So reach out for these uh, professionals. Not everyone is open as as me coming here. Yeah, don't uh, leave after this. Give me your card. We'll, we'll collaborate. <laughs> but I think this is what happens at GDC: is the chance to collaborate and maybe break through what seems to be a barrier that doesn't need to be. So I look forward to talking to you. Thank you for for bringing that. Um, I've got like three, I think three minutes left on the clock. Other questions about any aspect of this? I'd love to, to entertain a couple more questions. Yes, I have a question. Uh, Jose Zagal, University of Utah. So in academia, we're also tied to semesters or quarters and there's sort of timeliness factors. So I was wondering if you'd comment on how this the print on demand and doing all these cycles how you made that work in the context of semesters or the academic year. Yes, thank you. So, um, and we're starting to, a couple people have started to talk about it, about not saying you have to take this to market, but that you're, you go through the process of budgeting and then getting stuff ready to print. And I do a couple things. I did, a, there was a talk, my material was in a couple years ago here about um, doing non-binding agreements on teams because uh, around IP. So at RIT, all the students own their IP. So I have them do a non-binding agreement about how they would carry it forward past the class. I have them scope down so that they're going to actually produce the game in about uh, four to five weeks, very short, and get it ready to print. And then I say, okay, and then continue your playtesting. Maybe you take it to Protospiel, which my colleague Ian Schreiber you know, turned us on to. Um, continue playtesting, continue working. But do you know at a certain point you could hit the button and put it to market? So, um, so it's chunked that way. And also I talk to them about scope, about what type of game are you doing? If you're doing a sprawling dungeon crawler and it takes two and a half hours to play, it could be harder to get um, play tests in in time. So I try to get them to scope for that. I, I'm sorry, I can't, it says one minute, I think. So I try to get them to scope. So I'd say uh, scope, they don't have to print then. They have to think about and plan for what it would mean to print the next term um, to give them the, the path to access that. And the hope is that some, some of them are going to go forward and it'll become their portfolio piece or they might then pitch a publisher with it. I usually have them list what are the three publishers you want to reach out to with this game and go pitch to that publisher now that you've got a prototype, that kind of thing. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have time for one more or are we done? Uh, I, he said one more. Okay, great. 
Um, and so my question was, I saw you mentioned uh, doing like play testing with the print on demand. Uh, what's sort of the, the, the cutoff point when you go from hand making your, your play testing materials and when do you go to, to printing them? That's a tough question. Um, I would say we probably did from printing from spreadsheet to cards and PowerPoint in, in the Lost and Found games, maybe 60, 70 of those before we, we were parallel working with the artist team at the same time and then said, all right, now let's, we, we feel like we've gotten the showstoppers gone, now let's try. So it was kind of feeling for the play and that the play tests were at the point where players were responding in the realm we wanted them to and we wanted to get the, the, uh, the artwork together. We were also forced because we were on a budget. So our budget was gonna say, look, you have that much time to get it done, so the budget pushed us. Um, Ian always says, you know, the game is never done. It's done when you stop. So a combination of the financial pressure of, of a budget and time like a semester um, and how the play tests are going was how we made that decision. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'll be outside and happy to talk more about this with you.